to go through that one. All right, that is turned on. Well, we are technically live, and it is 9.56 in the room, as well as online. So a couple notes on a few of our hymns today. If you notice that that idea of living water was there, it was very present in the sermon. It was very present in our hymns. So fountain of those kind of themes where it was found throughout. So Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing was written in 1758 first by Robert Robinson who lived from 1735 to 1790 and it was written for the celebration of Pentecost and this one has quite a few changes over the years. Different hymns come from different traditions. Sometimes if you see at the bottom of the hymnal where it says alt it means that they changed something that either they didn't think worked poetically or textually or theologically. And so a few things, like we have, while the hope of endless glory originally was, teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above, which we changed to, fills my heart with joy and love. And then it went, praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, or teach me ever to adore thee, mount of God's unchanging love, may I still thy goodness prove. And it kept going throughout that. Some of it was just updating uh, language. The fourth verse was not originally included in many hymnals. Hymnal Supplement 98, which 1998, was one of the first to bring back that original stanza four. And that's that one, oh that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy wondrous face. And the original line next, it says, how I'll sing thy sovereign grace. So nothing really wrong with that, but it was a little too Calvinist for those on the hymnal committee, so they changed it to, How I'll Sing Thy Wondrous Grace. And then it also said at the end, Send thine angels now to carry me to air. That seemed a little bit harsh or um, abrupt, and so it was saying, Send thine angels soon to carry. So there's about... 10 or 12 different times when it changed little things in there. So we don't always notice all of those things, and it's probably okay that we don't get caught up in all of those little things. But as we sing that, I, I love that last stanza, when you get to that, Oh, that day when freed from sinning. And it's a, it's a beautiful hymn. I love it. And I wanted to say a little bit about the last hymn also, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. And Sometimes in church music, we can get so concerned with what we're going to do with the tune creatively or with a setting. This is one of those tunes that I always think, oh, I need to play the Paul Mons God of Grace piece after it. But I didn't today on, on purpose. But this is one 
where we have so many different scriptural allusions in it. So Exodus 16, we have that bread of heaven, the idea that's going on. So in the end of the hymn, it always repeats it too, if you notice that idea. In the original tunes, these Welsh ones, often the sopranos or the tenors would be hanging out on a note, and then the altos and the basses would be repeating it, so that, feed me till I want no more, want no more. So if you want to do that next time, Lutherans are really nervous about that kind of thing. The only time that it's in LSB like that is on It Is Well. It is well, it is well. The Presbyterians and the Methodists love doing that, and they're totally fine putting it in their hymnals. Lutherans don't like that. I think it makes us a little uncomfortable about singing in two different parts. But how that goes. Um, this is my personal opinion. If anybody from CPH is watching, awesome. Anyway, stanza two, we have the crystal fountain then from Exodus 17, flowing from the rock, God providing for his people in the wilderness. So that idea of living water was a good tie-in to those other things that we have from the Old Testament. And then we finally get there to Revelation 22, and that idea of the river of the water of life, brightest crystal flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So let the fiery, cloudy pillar, that brings us back again to Exodus. So it's a little bit of whiplash from Old Testament to New Testament imagery, but I think it, it works pretty well. And that last, when I tread the verge of Jordan, bid my anxious fears subside. So we go in a humble prayer at the end then. Death of death and hell's destruction, our comfort on the life's journey. Like 23rd Psalm, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, and then talking about being landed on Canaan's side, Joshua chapter 3, being brought to heaven, the ultimate promised land. The result is that the trusting child of God, us as we sing, renders songs of praise to the Lord, the Redeemer, the Messiah of Israel, and the Savior of the world. And the tune has kind of an interesting thing with it, too. Originally, it's really only 100 years old. It's not, not terribly old. But for many years, its spread was kind of controlled because of copyright. And they were getting, I think it was about a penny each, was getting from making these leaflets. And right now, we might think of investing in the stock market or Bitcoin or rental properties as the way to make large amounts of wealth. It's not. But this, at this time, actually, hymns were a pretty lucrative thing, and if you held the copyright, you could do that. So for the whole life of the composer, it really wasn't a, a big thing. It's a really popular tune now. It's pretty easy to sing. But after his lifetime, which at that time was copyright law in Britain, it got out to America, and we now know it as the familiar hymn that we can sing well in harmony. So... There's a little bit about some of our service music today. And when I look at my phone, I'm still moving my hand in it. This is, it's super weird. But I think it's time for me to get out of the picture and to invite our Bible study leaders forward. If you have any music at home that you play during this transition, this is the time to hit play. <laughs> Good morning, and thank you so much, Paul. I always enjoy hearing some of the background about our hymnody that uh, certainly brings more richness to our worship. So thank you, Paul. And good morning to everyone here in the room. I think most of you here know me. I've been here just five months. I'm Deaconess Jerry Morrison, for the sake of those of you online who may not know me yet. And uh, Pastor Bruick has been on vacation. He's come back, but the co-host today is uh, uh, Chuck, Blanco. Chuck Blanco. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> I drew a blank. Uh, so I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure. Um, I'm a member here at St. John and uh, teach across the street at Concordia in the theology department and work with uh, pre-SIM students. So pleasure to, to be here. All right, thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to our discussion today on John chapter 4, um, focusing a little bit more through the sermon and the mission aspect of this text. But there's a lot of meat here. There's a lot of different directions we could have gone with this. But we'll stick with the mission 
aspect for the most part. Um, and if anyone here in the room would like to participate, we ask that you would come up to the microphone so that our uh, folks online could hear your questions and comments. So um, I'll start with praying. And um, our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this beautiful day that you've given us the refreshing rains overnight and the past few days. We ask that you would grant our farmers success uh, through those rains. Lord, we thank you for the worship that you've provided for us and that uh, we get to worship you in spirit and in truth. Guide us now as we study your word and um, bless us in our work. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So. How about if I start by reading the text? And we're going to kind of take turns since it is a, a little bit of a chunk. Um, so starting with John 4, verse 4. And he came to pa had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus was wearied as he was from his journey and was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask me for a drink a woman from Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and this well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will be in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Continuing at John 4, 16, Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. And we're getting a little feedback, a little light pop. Um, the woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband, for you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then the disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. 
But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Has anyone brought him something to eat? Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are four, yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true, one sows, another reaps. I sent you to reap that for, for that which you did not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, for we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this indeed is the Savior of the world. So... I think the thing that strikes me first is right there in our first verse that we read, verse 4, and he had to pass through Samaria. He had to go. He was compelled. It reminds me of uh, when he was lost, and he said to his parents, didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? And then, too, with Paul, and I'm sure other times with Jesus, too, but Paul, he was going to go to one place, and he said, but I had to go to Macedonia. Yeah, he had multiple routes he could have taken, and he did take in other times, but uh, this time he does go right through Samaria. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, very unlikely for a Jew (laughs) to be doing. You can still visit the place. It's uh, in West Bank territory, so not every tour uh, goes in, in that region, but uh, you can go to where Jacob's well is, and we hear reference about what a deep well it is, and it really is deep. Uh, They can lower a bucket down, and everybody does this when you go. So then they get a ladle, and they tip it over from up on top, and then you start counting. One, two, three. You're listening for the splash, and so it really is a a deep, deep well. And it's fun. You can uh, still drink of it. Wow. Neat. Neat. Um... And then I'm thinking, too, along those same lines of being compelled uh, and our mission-mindedness. In 2 Corinthians 5, it says, For the love of Christ compels us. So uh, the faith that we have that's welling up inside us, it spills out and, uh, and affects other people. So, um, yeah. One of the features uh, Jerry and I talked about as we were uh, just chatting uh, yesterday about about the passages is what a a human picture of Jesus we have uh, presented here. Um, He doesn't fly into town as Superman. Uh, He doesn't, uh, you know, just instantly appear at the well. Instead, he's he's on a journey. And again, in uh, in Israel, there's no flat spaces. Everything is up and down, up and down, up and down. So if you weren't in good shape when you go to visit Israel, you're in better shape when you come back because there's uh, just not not many flat spots. So he was, uh, it says in the text, he was wearied from the journey. Mm -hmm. And he he truly was. uh, The the wearied word there in the original shows his resultant state. So he was tired and then we got there. He was still tired and he he sits at the well while while the disciples go in uh, to get uh, food. And uh, he's thirsty, so we can all identify Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. With that, uh, my wife, uh, Rebecca, and I were in in, uh, the Houston area last week, and it was actually cooler in Houston than it was when we got back here in Seward (laughs) on Friday. And so uh, a hot day, but, you know, been gone for a week, so you got to mow the lawn. And, you know, just that uh, uh, you're you're tired, you're hot, and you're thirsty. So a very, very human Jesus we have depicted here. Yes. And then he asks her for help. He humbled himself and allowed her to serve out of the gifts and the means that she had. Um, 
So, and I think in that way, he gives her value uh, rather than coming in as uh, an authority figure and I have the power and you need what I have. He gives her value and asks her to help him. Uh, this is about uh, probably 50 years ago now. I, re I read an article uh, by, uh, I can't remember who the author was now, but he said, uh, I, I want to be a burden to my children when I grow old. And, and so often people have that opposite view. I don't want to burden my children. Of course, right. there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, the author's point was, no, uh, I want my children to have that experience of serving me, uh, flipping the tables, whereas parents, you know, so often, you know, provide uh, for their children. No, I want to be a burden so that they also know that I depended upon them. Mm -hmm. and, and they learn that, uh, that gift of giving rather right. than just receiving. Right. And I think that's meaningful for us here in our uh, lives as brothers and sisters in Christ, too. Um, I think too often we try to be completely independent, and God didn't create us to be independent. He created us to be in relationship, and uh, giving other people the opportunity to serve is uh, so valuable uh, for them and for us to be able to learn how to receive and not just give. Uh, and Pastor Boring in his sermon talked about the, the cultural, you know, issue here mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. uh, Samaritans and uh, not typically associating uh, with the rest of, of the Jewish people, uh, mixed religion in, in Samaria from uh, mm -hmm. foreign influences and so on. So there usually wasn't uh, a lot of association going on. And the, the word that says that Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans uh, some commentators think that maybe the issue was Jesus didn't have any cup or bucket to, to draw water from, so it would be very unusual for him to drink out of her vessel. The sharing of the vessels would have you know, kind of been a, a cross-contamination. And so that may have been what was there, although the comment might just be Samaritans and Jews know that they have you know different cultures, different uh, religious backgrounds, and, and so they go their own separate ways. Yeah. And like so many other times in Scripture, Jesus breaks down those barriers that we put in place. Um, and, and here it's uh, race and gender barriers. Uh, he's not even supposed to be talking to a woman. <laughs> so. Um, but then he meets her where she is, and he's willing to listen to her story. And I think that's an important aspect of our uh, efforts to, for mission-mindedness and evangelism, to be willing to listen and um, find that little piece of commonality, uh, especially if somebody is so drastically different from our own perspective. Um, so. in, in working uh, through this again this morning, her response uh, about, uh, to Jesus, you know, are you greater than Jacob? <laughs> And so she, she really is, you know, working yeah. uh, from her position. Uh, Jacob, when he did his sojourning, because he, he, he was a lot of places in the Old Testament, but he's in this area by the well and by Bethel. Uh -huh. This is uh -huh. in the central region of Israel. Uh, but the patriarchs at that time, they didn't control Jerusalem. That was not, not really uh, someplace that they would, they would go to, uh, to live. Uh, Jacob then lived uh, with... A where Abraham was down before Hebron in the south of Israel. Okay. Uh, but uh, so Samaria here, Hebron uh, down here, and Jerusalem right in the middle. And so Jerusalem becomes identified with, you know, David and his descendants, the Jews, the, the re return from exile. And so that's kind of a world to itself. The Samaritans still laid claim uh, to Jacob, although uh, certainly the, the Jews did well, uh, did as well. Uh, but she's really speaking out of, you know, her history and her heritage mm -hmm. uh, bringing mm -hmm. up Jacob. Yeah, and I, I can appreciate the progression too, that she acknowledges that I perceive that you are a prophet, and then she listens, and he tells her everything about her, and then she runs and tells the town. This man told me all that he, 
he, uh, he knows about me. And uh, we know that the Christ would be able to do this, so could he be the Christ? And getting that uh, progression through the story and building that relationship uh, along right. the way. So. And then the, the word planted, uh, just yes. you don't have to have all the answers, uh, but right. to say something remarkable you know, about the, who this Jesus might be. And then yeah. people wanted to come out and yeah. uh, see for themselves if, if what he said. And you wonder uh, if he told all of them <laughs> everything they had ever done. Uh, they all had that same experience <laughs> as yeah. uh, the woman did. Yeah. And one of the disciples did that, too. He said, you know, here's Jesus. Come and see. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we don't have to have all the answers. And that's very comforting. But we know who has the answers. And we can get people connected to more substantial. Any questions, comments uh, from our audience? Thank you. You know I always have a comment. Um, yes, thank you. I find it interesting how when we see so often in the New Testament Jesus interacting with people, uh, very often the Jews, he sometimes speaks in how they would kind of say speaking in riddles or, or saying things not entirely clearly that you sort of have to come to some understanding of what he's talking about, especially when he's talking about mm -hmm. the Messiah. Mm-hmm. But here, with the Samaritan woman, he comes right out and says, you, you're talking about the Messiah. I'm him. He doesn't hide that at all. He doesn't make it confusing. He just says, I'm it. Yeah. It's interesting to see that difference. Yeah. Thank you for that. The, uh, the conversation about the water, of course, is fitting. They're at the well. He's thirsty. So he uh, you know, takes the metaphor at hand and starts to expand on it. Um, yeah. John chapter six, uh, bread of life. So, you know, he'd just done the miracle. They were there, there was no place to eat. So he, he took the occasion at hand and then expanded on it. Now, now of course he's Jesus, you know, so it's, it's not fair because he is, you know, so <laughs> adept at this. But maybe the more we read through the scriptures and see, uh, we can maybe have a lot of, you know, arrows in our quiver too Mm -hmm. And think about uh, if there's only one way we know to talk about what the gospel is, Jesus forgives your sins, which is absolutely true. Uh, but maybe our repertoire is a little bit, you know, stunted. And uh, the more we view scripture, uh, we can see that the Bible has you know, multifaceted ways of mm -hmm. explaining this, uh, this wondrous thing that God has done for us in his grace yeah. and so you want to talk about it in bread sure i can do that how about water oh yeah why not yeah a uh, new birth sure we can do that he's already done it with with nicodemus and right. you know a new sight the blind man in john chapter 9 uh jesus says uh, you know take note of what's going on around you and then see if you can connect that um you know in people's lives around you with uh, the message of the good news, which the, with the gift of God, which Jesus, you know, refers to himself in that way. You know, if, if you knew the gift of God that is right here talking to you, um, you would yeah. be asking him. Yeah. And, and I love that analogy of gift. And it's not something we've earned or deserved, and it's there for us to receive and make use of. Um, the well was a gift. Uh, the water was a gift from God. They would have right. uh, thought that too. Uh, you know, Jacob had given the gift uh, generations and generations. They were still uh, drinking from it. But it was a limited gift. Uh, you're going to have to come to this well and drink again. You're always going to be thirsty yeah. again. So Jesus, almost like a parable, he, he starts with the earthly level, but then he goes mm -hmm. to the higher kingdom a meaning. And, and he yeah. says, okay, you're this water is good, uh, give thanks to God for it. But here's a water, and, and knowing me that will quench, you know, the thirst in your soul and mm -hmm. your heart and your mind and, you know, in all of yourself. Um, and, and so the, the terminology of living water comes up, you know, several times uh, in, in this yeah. and give you life, uh, a spring of water. So I don't know, that we should have Joel Helmer come in here and tell us about, uh, you know, <laughs> geology and geography and, 
and springs. Some, some of you may know a lot about springs, but you know, underground and as the gases uh, build up, then it, it pushes the water up, and so you get a bubbling spring, a living uh, spring. The Gihon okay. Spring in Jerusalem was like that, and it would bubble up uh, several times a day and, and flow into a pool. But, but this is one, not stagnant water, not right. water that would go bad, right. uh, but living water, uh, a spring, a, a bubbling right. thing. Uh, our, I guess our most famous one is Old Faithful in, uh, okay. in Yellowstone that, that, that would do that. Yeah, and I've heard that the living water also refers to that things are living in it. So a living stream would have fish and algae and life is sustained within that. Um, so. Some liturgical purists uh, or, or ecclesiastical purists, uh, they say a baptismal font should always mm -hmm. have living water. In it. It, it shouldn't be stagnant, but it's really hard to wire it and keep the pumps going and that, <laughs> this kind of stuff. So there, there's a definite downside to it. But at Concordia in our chapel, um, the, the font there, I think does still mm -hmm. have a water feed and, right. and a pump. I don't think we use it all the time, but uh, the water can be living. And it is a kind of a homage to, to yeah. John chapter four. Cool. And last night we had a baptism in worship too, so that was really a yeah. cool connection. So, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, <clears throat> yeah, somebody Tim, else coming. Thank yeah. you, Tim. Going back a little bit, I'm kind of intrigued by uh, taking advantage of you know, what's going on around us to uh, understand the gospel. And uh, I, I kind of think, well, what's going on around us today that we might, or if Jesus were here today, he might be able to use, you know, technology, of course, is obvious and stuff. Mm -hmm. But I've often wondered what are some things around us that, and this is kind of a question for all of us, uh, what kinds of modern uh, metaphors might be available to us that we could use. Mm -hmm. uh, first thing that comes to mind is some churches that I'm aware of will often use uh, movies or oh. things like that and tie it in as kind of a modern parable to understanding what Jesus has done for us. But I'm just wondering what else, if, if you thought of that or if anybody else here has thought of what we might take advantage of. Excellent point, Tim. Thank you. Anybody want to um, toss out some ideas from our group? He's a great physician. So we've great got, physician. you know, virus uh, issues and, you know, uh, with the virus, you know, we talked about you know, how you have to have a mask that can actually block the virus if you're going to be, you know, medical uh, working with people so that those N95 masks that they needed. Uh, but a very tiny thing, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. produced profound impact in the world and so we can think about mm -hmm. you know the mustard seed uh, analogy or jesus you know coming to to earth as just this tiny baby born you know laid in a stable but he has a major impact in, in the history of the world god loves to take what is small and make something big out of it so there, there, there could be something just in talking about how this virus so tiny but it, it Mm -hmm. upended you know the world for a year and a half and uh yeah maybe god works that way too we can share that with people right and to get back on our mission track here we uh, compared to the entire universe are just this tiny little being and yet as we plant and water with the seeds of the gospel that has a tremendous impact around the world and we won't know till we get to heaven how much impact we've had just by caring for somebody um, and it could be just a simple smile and how are you today um, or bringing a meal or any of the things that we considered oh it's just a little thing that i just did uh, but it has a big impact. Later on in the, in the text, uh, when the disciples come back and, and they wonder if somebody has brought him some food. So it, here's an instance where Jesus, you know, is speaking cryptically and they don't <laughs> uh, quite get it. But he says, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish mm -hmm. his, uh, his work. And then he, he takes that and he shifts uh, there with kind of a proverb. Uh, don't, 
you all know the seasons, right? There, you know, it's not harvest time now. You have to wait, you know, until the right season. So do you not say, oh, there are four months to go yet, and then comes the harvest. Uh, but where Jesus is, he is going to, you know, kind of break some of those proverbial expressions. And he says, lift up your eyes. The, the harvest time is ready now. And then he, he talks about reaping and sowing. And so just what you said, Deaconess, uh, Typically, the one who would plant uh, would want to have part of the harvest, uh, but sometimes the mm -hmm. planters and the harvesters were, were two different people. And so in this one, the, he says the harvester, uh, the one who's reaping, already is receiving wages. And that might get a little bit lost to us. Uh, but when the harvesters come, and, and we know about this too, when it's harvest time, you want to get the crops in pronto, uh, you know, you could you get hailed out you know if, if you wait too long so you had a lot of groups that would come and they still do this in our, in our country too and they go around and make sure that harvest gets in as quickly as possible but of course if you're a farmer you don't pay the harvester until they're done with the harvest because <laughs> they might take that money and just you know bolt and and leave you with nothing so here uh, he's saying doubling down on that the harvest time is already here because these harvesters, these reapers, are already receiving their, their wages. And then another uh, kind of a interesting, it's hard to tell if it's uh, you know, actually part of the text or not, but it might be, um, the sower and the reaper rejoice uh, together. Uh, one sows and another reaps, he says in verse 37, and, and one Bible I looked at, it, uh, the cross-reference system sent us back to Micah and to Job, uh, both negative comments that uh, you weren't going to be able to harvest what you planted. Uh, God's going to intervene with judgment. And so you've expended all this labor uh, planting, but somebody else is going to, uh, you know, eat your, your harvest, a negative experience. And maybe, you know, modern for us, uh, we live in the Midwest, we know that not every, you know, crop that is planted is successful and how frustrating that is when mm -hmm. you put all that work and cost into planting but there isn't a harvest very very frustrating in the ancient world it might happen this way you plant you know early on in the season but that's also the season of warfare so your neighboring country might come in and declare war on you and drive you out or enslave you and so you don't get to reap the harvest. Somebody else gets the benefit of your labor. Here Jesus is turning this into a positive uh, thing. The sower and the reaper are rejoicing together. And, and maybe one part of that is that the, uh, the crops were so thick, the fields are so ripe unto harvest, it takes the reaper, the harvester, a long, long time to harvest the crops. So long, in fact, that he's doubling over into the next season of the planters. And so maybe this very, very rich uh, harvest is going on so that both the sower and the reaper, they rejoice together in this you know, common field. It's a, it's a fun thing. But Vinny, back, back on, on Jerry's thought, others have labored and now you enter into their labor. Mm -hmm. And so when, mm -hmm. I, when I was uh, a parish pastor, I, I remembered that uh, I'm going into a yeah. place where people have already done a lot of work. Uh, pastors mm -hmm. and lay mm -hmm. people, uh, lay people have paid for this building. You know, they, they've been here through you know, all these things. So I, I tell this to our pre sem students, you always want to value what uh, has gone on in the kingdom uh, before you. You are entering in to the labor of others. Uh, give thanks to God for that. Mm -hmm. And then leave the place in a, in a good position so that others who come in, they, they can benefit uh, from your labor as well. Right. I was on a mission trip to Tanzania in 2004, and the first Sunday we were there, there were dozens of people who came to be baptized. And it's not because of anything we did. It's the planting and watering and harvesting that everybody else did. We just got to be witnesses of that and assist in that uh, pouring of water. But 
Also, back to what you were just talking about with the reapers and harvesters uh, rejoicing together, could that also be an eschatological picture? Absolutely, yeah. Any kind of harvest metaphor in the Bible is, you know, thinking uh, forward there. So uh, who's going to be in heaven? Okay, that's God's call. But we will rejoice uh, yeah. together. And so the, the common voice, uh, we get into the book of Revelation, these pictures of heaven, mm-hmm. always the saints gathered around uh, the, the throne and the lamb and uh, rejoicing and, and singing. So, yeah. A couple other things that uh, Jerry and I were, were chatting about. So that when the Samaritans come, you know, they compel Jesus uh, to stay, and he does stay for another two days. And maybe a tie in uh, to the mission theme here is that God is adjustable uh, to our requests. Um, mm-hmm. This wasn't on Jesus' itinerary to stay there that long. Apparently, he was, you know, just passing through. If he got his water and food, he would continue on up uh, into Galilee. But he adjusts his itinerary to meet the needs of the people uh, who were there. And maybe his disciples felt pretty uncomfortable about, you know, staying with the Samaritans for for another two days. Jesus doesn't seem too concerned about that. Um, So this is maybe we can think of prayer this way. Um, We pray not so much uh, to to tell God what to do or or to inform him, but, but we pray so that we know as he answers, he's making adjustments on the fly to accommodate our needs, uh, our, our wants, the, the things that are uh, on our hearts. And that's a great thing to think about, God. Uh, I use an analogy in class sometimes with a parent with a toddler, and so they're walking, you know, holding on the, the toddler's hands, and wherever the toddler wants to go, the parents are willing to go um, to, uh, to a limit. Uh, but <laughs> if the toddler is going to get in danger, the parents pick him up. Nope, we're not going to go over there. Let's go over here. Okay, now you're in control again, kid, and, and, and I'll go with you. And so God is greatly adaptable to, uh, to our requests and our calls. Yes. And I think that speaks to the Holy Spirit working through us to make us adaptable to the people around us, to be mindful of the needs that people have and the means and the gifts that we have so that we can reach them um, and gain that opportunity, the privilege to be able to share the reason for the hope that is in us. And why am I doing this? It's because Christ's love compels me. Um, and, uh, yeah. Here's uh, something a little bit off, off the mission thing, uh, mission theme, but I, I read a book uh, several summers ago by a Christian uh, scholar woman, uh, Lynn Kohick was her name, and she wrote about uh, women in the early church era in the first, and first century BC and first century AD. So she did a lot of searching through Roman records, marriage records, a lot, a lot of sources, and was able to, to put together uh, maybe a, a fuller picture of the place of women in ancient society than than we can uh, sometimes have. And she uh, wrote quite a bit about uh, this text in John 4. And I'll I'll preface this by saying uh, it's entirely possible that when Jesus speaks to her about the five husbands and the one she has now is not her husband, it, it may be that she was a woman of some loose morals or serial relationships uh, that might actually uh, have been the case. Uh, we can also say the text doesn't actually come out and assert that. And so this uh, Lynn Kohick made the case that in the ancient world, it was not at all unusual for a woman to have had multiple husbands uh, because they lived in the days before OSHA, before <laughs> work safety rules. Uh, men had this nasty habit of dying on the job. And... Uh, leaving a woman then as a widow, but there weren't a lot of, you know, economic prospects uh, for a a widow woman. So perhaps, you know, to seek another marriage or a man, you know, to to marry her. And so Koik uh, suggested that maybe what we have here is not a woman who has had, you know, serial lovers, you know, and and is kind of the town uh, Lucy one, but 
maybe we witness here a woman who has had some tragic, tragic. luck in marriages, uh, five times, and maybe all five dead. Or another scenario, maybe you know three of them died and two other husbands divorced her for someone else. Uh, if on the on the five dead scenario, that might explain why the one she's with now not going to marry because you know does she see herself as kind of cursed? You know the the black widow, right? And she marries him, and he's he's going to uh, bump off too. But maybe the story is not so much one of bad morality, but her story is tragic loss. Um, you know, you bury a bunch of spouses here. And, and, and maybe it doesn't make any difference, you know, broken by sin or, or broken by the, the events of the world that come to us. Um, Jesus knows her story. And he tells her everything. And then he reveals himself to her as the Messiah. This deep thirst, whether it's, you know, a thirst for relief from moral failure, which would be a, a thirst for forgiveness, or maybe just a thirst for something beyond the brokenness of this world where, you know, my, yeah. my life is this one disappointment after another. Jesus is the living water yeah. that will minister to her and, and yeah. bring her some, some healing. And when I, I, I read that in this book by uh, Lynn Koch, I keep saying her name because it's really, it's a thick book and it's you know, scholarly, you know, so you've got to want to get through it. But it made me just look at this encounter in a different way. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Jesus knows all our stories. Yeah. He knows the scars in our hearts. Right. He knows the joys. He knows the disappointments. He knows the frustrations. Um, and he, he comes to right. bring a wellspring of living water and healing and refreshment, a new start, a new beginning. He is yeah. the gift. Yeah. yeah. And I think that brings us back to his humanness, too, because he does so deeply understand our human nature and what we're going through. He's able to bring that compassion that just exactly meets our need. We uh, just have a, a few minutes left, about five minutes left. The reading from Ephesians today, you know, is very, very thick uh, theologically. But again, Jerry and I were, were uh, chatting yesterday. This is Ephesians chapter 1, 3 to 14 is the, uh, is the text. But maybe just a, a little bit uh, on it here. The strength of the language that's used uh, about God's work of salvation to us. And again, uh, the tie-in with gift, what God has done uh, to bring us into a relationship with himself through his son, uh, Jesus. And so if, if you're there, we're not, I'm not going to take the time to read it, but maybe just uh, pull out uh, a few things. Uh, cha Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 3. Uh, God has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He doesn't do this with an eyedropper. You know, he does it with a front end loader uh, where he comes and he brings this, you know, every spiritual blessing. He chose us before the foundation of the world. Um, so we, we could talk about, you know, predestination a lot. We don't have time, which, which is pretty smart on our part, right? To get to it at the <laughs> end when we run out of time. Um, but he chose us and selected us. It, it's not happenstance. It's not a, you know, a goof uh, that he just bumped into us, but he's right. chosen us uh, right. that we should be holy and blameless before him in love. He, he brings us into his family through adoption according to the purpose of his will, not happenstance, but he, he's got this plan that he's working out for us. Um, we have redemption through uh, the blood of Jesus, which is the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Um, God does not have a, uh, a cistern of grace that, oops, running out, no more for you. Uh, sorry, yeah. uh, Grace is, you know, uh, off the shelves. We saw how, you know, the shelves during the, the virus time were much more empty. No, yeah. God's grace is rich. He lavished this grace upon us, poured it out in an abundance. 
uh, didn't just cover over our sin with a thin veneer, uh, but completely drowned it. This similar language is used and connected with baptism in, in Galatians. Uh, his plan is the, for the fullness of time to unite all things to himself. We have an inheritance in him that is uh, you know, according to his plan and his counsel. Um, we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee, the down payment of our inheritance until we acquire it. And so Jerry and I were talking uh, yesterday, and sometimes people uh, can, can wonder, you know, am I, am I really going to be saved? And sometimes we yeah. think, well, if it's going to happen, maybe it's just going to be by the skin of our teeth. Yeah. And of course, if you have a sensitive conscience and you're aware of your sin, you know that, you know, it's a miracle right. if any of us are, are going to get saved. But the good news here of God's mm -hmm. word is that none of us are saved by the skin of our teeth. We are saved by the richness of God's grace and right. mercy, uh, all to the praise of his glory. Mm -hmm. And so none of us barely get in. We get in safe and sound yes. because God has arranged that uh, through the redemption we have through his son, Jesus. That's good news on our thin days when we think <laughs> there's no way we're going to make it. Right. or no way we should make it, which, you know, there's a certain amount of truth to that. But then it's time to calm down and think about the gift of God, who is Jesus, who is the living water that wells up within us, who lavishes it upon right. us. And yeah. uh, so we can take a deep breath yes. and rejoice to the praise of his glory. Yes. And I think that comes back again to our relationship with a living Lord who also gives us relationship with each other, that we can come alongside each other and hold each other up. And when my faith is weak, you can support me in that, and, um, and vice versa. Uh, so oh. Pastor Boring in his sermon kind of challenged us, you know, to uh, not just say, okay, I went to church and I'm done, but now uh, what happens next? And so yeah. maybe, you know, working off of that, we, we talked early on, Jesus could go in whatever direction the woman led uh, the conversation, he went with her, uh, you know, and he, he could talk to about meaningful things there. So maybe part of our project, again, is to expand our metaphors or our connections. Oh, yeah, there's a connection to the gospel. Oh, yeah, there's another one. If you've got blank pages in the back of your Bible, every time you read one and you can make a connection. So the more practiced we are at this, the more at ease we are in conversations with people and say, you know, uh, it's so great to have a, so, you know, cold water on such a hot day. And, and I'm grateful for this, uh, you know, thirst of, that I have in my deep soul that Jesus has quenched and make, work mm -hmm. it into a relationship. And if you'd want, you know, yeah. talk more about that, we sure can. All right, we're out of time, I think. Would you like to close our Sure, prayer? yeah, let's do that. Thank you. Blessed are you, Heavenly Father, for in your great mercy, you did send your son Jesus to be our redemption, to be the living water, to uh, refresh our souls and to give us new life. You indeed know our whole stories. You know all that we have ever done, uh, both the good and the sinful, how we have been battered and broken and disappointed in life. And Lord, you know us through and through. And yet you come and you speak to us through your word and you engage us and you lavish us with your gifts. We thank and praise you for forgiveness, for life, for hope, for renewal. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would use us as sowers and also harvesters uh, according to your plan. Help us to enter into the fields and share the good news that you have granted us. Uh, by the power of your spirit, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, and thank you, everybody. God bless your day.